Good morning. I, and maybe you are already in afternoon. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry I was a little bit late because of my Uber and taxis and so on, but now I'm here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm I'm very honored to be to have been invited to discuss your book and it's a very well written book. It's very uh, it's enjoyable to read and, and I am for some years now reading uh, literature on embodied cognition and the the issues that arise in the discussion between uh, representationalists and uh, and people from the modern population that try to establish new approaches to meaning, to thought, and so on, without speaking about representations in a strict sense. So, I understand that uh, you are doing a, a huge effort to avoid a, a very traditional vocabulary that was used during the whole 20th century, um, focusing mainly on syntactical structures and on reference. And so I, I, I see all what we are doing in academy nowadays as an effort to improve our understanding of human beings and of other animals and of our environment and so on. And every contribution that gives us more, um, not data, but more capacity to understand ourselves, our environment, is, is a very uh, important project. So, I will, when I wrote, was reading your book, I was thinking how analytical was my thoughts, <laughs> because I was trying to anal analyze uh, your sentences many times, but your book uh, is a kind of a mirror of your um, purposes that are, or goals that are to change the way we are explaining human beings and language and human language. So I, I won't say that I fully understand understood uh, all your. Uh, sentences or all your model, but uh, I think I, I could uh, feel and I could um, uh, incarnate, embody uh, a little bit of your thoughts. So I will speak about a, a little bit about, about some issues I have been thinking about related to embodied cognition approaches and, and related also to view, re, reductionist views that I myself uh, think that have some reasons to not to be fully accepted but to be taken seriously. Uh, so, is it is it's changing? No, it's not changing. So, normally, uh, in science, as Adolfo was speaking about. <laughs> we try to establish uh, some physical laws or some biological norms or social norms uh, even when we are uh, speaking about languages. And one of the main uh, 
challenges uh, we have and neuroscience and social neuroscience is facing nowadays is to try to unify all these norms and laws or and as in physics uh, between quantum physics or um, or uh, Newton Newtonian physics, we don't have a really. Um, uh, we can see that the unification will be will succeed nowadays. So it's very hard to to see how we could uh, link social norms, for example, to physical laws. Uh, just as an example. Uh, we have the reduction uh, of DNA to physical laws. I ask, is it a reduction? Maybe not. So, what we do when we try to reduce, uh, reduce, reduce sorry, DNA to, to physical laws, we speak about chromosomes, we speak about, the, uh, about DNAs, we, we speak about genes, uh, proteins, we, we try to analyze all these items, all these parts, and we, we can achieve very single uh, parts that we call molecules, we call atoms, and nowadays we have microscopes that can see atoms, what was very uh, something very difficult to achieve. So we can say that we know the basic parts of life in a sense. You can, for example, uh, make a model of an uh, hydrogen uh, atom and uh, moreover you can uh, establish an equation uh, algebraic equation that tells you what a hydrogen atom is so in some sense we know the internal structure of life itself. So, and we know the physical laws that underlie chemistry, for example, and the chemistry of life. Uh, is that a reduction? Is that a reduction? Uh, it could be seen as a reduction, but it, it shows. I I, um, uh, I will use what Adolfo was saying. It shows that we analyze as scientists uh, our environment uh, so that we can establish some very precise, it seems so, laws about uh, the, its parts. In, so in what sense this can be, this kind of methodological, scientific um, approach can be linked to new embodied cognition theories. I think neuroscience uh, has uh, a little bit of both, as Adolfo was saying. Neuro neuroscience uses very precise instruments that only could be built because uh, of our scientific analytic equations. But at the same time, we need uh, broad theories that link all these parts that science 
decomposes. I, I want to speak a little bit now about the origin of embodied cognition theories because in the, in the origin of these theories we have robotics and I think robotics shows a challenge to these embodied cognition theories because the, the new robotics was in some sense one of the causes for the, the embodied cognition theories because um, new robotics shows that a mechanism, not a living mechanism, but a, a non-living mechanism, can react in a very simple way to the environment and can act in this environment uh, without um, a very complex software. So, someone in the last day spoke about the rombas who clean our floors. So, the rombas are very simple computer, very simple robots, and they react in a very simple manner, but they clean the floor. <laughs> so, and they interact with us also sometimes, and with the cats. Uh, so, um, robotics was the, this. This new robotics was one of the causes for embodied cognition theories because it shows we don't need a robot that represents reality, we need a robot that reacts to obstacles. And we are similar. Uh, we react to obstacles, we don't represent, we, we don't need to represent obstacles so as to react to them. Um, how much time do I have? I didn't ask if we have Wi-Fi. I'm sorry. Uh, do we have so Wi-Fi? Wi okay. no, it's um, so I'm working as a hack. Huh? Can you do? I could say the wrong time. No? No. 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 Okay. So maybe if uh, this was a uh, kind of it's coming to film up. It's still. 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 It's Thousands of birds uh, do kind of designs uh, and and how they fly together in the skies. They also uh, and this they are doing with small robots. So the robots they can rep replicate in some sense how uh, natural living beings assemble and how they uh, create. Uh, structures in nature. For example, they they have nowadays robots that create tree-like structures using uh, just um, uh, a, a, a kind of software that identifies light, and so they 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 adapt to each other. The small robots they adapt to each other, and they, this adaptation of Hundreds of robots together uh, creates a, a structures that we can also see in nature. Maybe. I don't know if they can see. Do you think they can see? No, Wi Fi is very good. It's not so good. But so, and you can, for example, also um, uh, have robots that uh, replicate the, the way bacteria react uh, together and how bacteria uh, can find food, for example. And the structure of thousands of robots uh, can be the same structures 
of thousands of bacteria when they are trying to find food. So uh, robotics is imitating life and at the same time is showing that the same structure uh, we can see in a uh, natural environment can be replicated when we use small, uh, very simple robots. So this kind of robotic uh, is not uh, very far away from the view that Maturana and Varela uh, developed in, in, 84, in, in 84, for example. Uh, I want to... No. <laughs> So I want to end with a comment about life, nature, life, continuity. When we look at these uh, new developments in robotics, and when we try to think in body cognition theory in the light of these new developments, I think one philosophical problem is the problem how to uh, face nature life continuity, which is a, a very old philosophical problem in philosophy of science. Huh? Do we have a nature life continuity? Uh, can we know how life emerged from uh, non living? So, uh, I, when I visit once Ruth Minikan in the United States, one of the, se the sentences she said to me, and that was very impressive, was that there is no leap from nature to human nature, and there is no leap from uh, animal nature, non-human nature, to human nature. And, and she said that, um, and, and she said that so as to, to distingu distinguish herself from other philosophers which, which are very strong in academy that say that we jumped from a simple or primitive animal nature to a human nature. And as Millikan, I believe there is no jump between non-human to human nature. So my main concern when I criticize reductionism of any kind myself is to dialectically fall on the opposite side, which would be to forget the continuity of nature and life. Forgetting this continuity would sometimes mean thinking of the human being as a special being. Perhaps in order for human dignity to be taken seriously, we need to emphasize the value, relevance, and beauty of human existence. I admit it. Sometimes we do this also when we defend the lives and rights of other animals. But ethically valuing and aesthetically admiring human beings or other living beings is not the same as scientifically explaining to laws or regularities or causal norms the emergence of patterns, living patterns or social patterns. Moreover, to emphasize the emergence of new patterns, new variation in genes, behaviors, and social interactions should not lead us to consider that, as Ruth Millikan states, I am a biological effect of a natural leap, which takes us to a different level of life. To 
claim that we are living cinetic, sensitive, emotional, thinking bodies acting according to functions and norms does not mean that we transcend nature. So why I'm saying that? Because uh, at the same time that I agree that the body cognition theories are doing something very important to um, emphasize that we, we shouldn't just reduce uh, human nature to physical laws or to biological norms, at the same time, I, I am afraid to criticize, when I criticize reductionism, to follow in the opposite side and forget the continuity of nature and life. We will probably never know everything there is to know about nature or about human nature. And the way we express knowledge is not a mirror of nature, that's for sure. But all this does not mean that the way we express our knowledge is not the right way to know about human beings. Many theories can really shed some light on different aspects of nature, life and human life. Perhaps explaining the different levels of nature does not uh, mean strictly producing in the sense of explaining away one level by another, but perhaps to interpret a level by another means using different lenses in different layers of the same world. For example, explaining the emergence of social behaviors and patterns through a more basic level of, mole of molecular or atomic interactions would not, not allow us to explain our, uh, our description of the behavioral level, mainly because as human beings we cannot see all the layers or explain them all at the same time. So uh, this is my main message uh, and also this, uh, I think uh, you can comment is that um, from, uh, from one point of view, I agree that we must have many discourses about human life and one of them is, is the discourse that take into account embodied cognition theories. But at the same time, we should not uh, uh, see other, other discourses that mm, maybe are more uh, reductivists as something that would just uh, need to be explained away. I think um, uh, I would like very much to, to hear what you uh, would say about uh, my comments uh, and uh, I had some um, So I thank you very much and that was.